Hey Rolling Out, this is Crystal Jordan, your host, and I am actually on assignment today. This is the weekend of Martin Luther King Jr.'s holiday, and I am honored to be sitting with our one of our uh, candidates for the 2024 presidential race. I am sitting here next to uh, Mr. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. First of all, thank you so much for sitting down and talking to Rolling Out, and welcome to Atlanta. Crystal, thanks for having me. Well, we're excited. Like I said, this is, um, this is an exciting weekend. Uh, we know that living here in Atlanta, Rolling Out has been a part of this community since 1996. And so we've had an opportunity to celebrate Martin Luther King holiday. But a lot of people don't really realize that the relationship between the Kennedys and the King family and the history there with the civil rights movement goes back so much further than what a lot of people realize. Can you share a little bit about what some people may not know about the history between your family, the Kennedys, and the King family? My uncle, John F. Kennedy, was uh, president. Was running for president of the United States in 1960. My father was his campaign manager. And they were both from Boston, and civil rights was not really on their radar. It was, you know, they were concerned about other issues, about organized crime, about foreign policy. Um, but uh, during the election, in October of 1960, so that would have been uh, one month before the election, mm -hmm. Martin Luther King was arrested in DeKalb County, Georgia. And he was arrested because some of the members of SNCC, of the, um, which was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, mm -hmm. run by John Lewis, had persuaded him against his better judgment to participate in a lunch counter sit-in. Yes. And he had been sentenced to jail. And he, he, in the middle of the night, he was woken up in the county jail at 4 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And he didn't know where he was going. They never, the police never told him. He thought he may be going to an execution. Mm -hmm. He was uh, brought into what he called cracker country, mm -hmm. uh, where a lynching would not have been objected to by the local community. And they, but they were really bringing him to a state prison. Mm -hmm. And Coretta King was panicked when they, when she found out he'd been moved, and she tried. To, she got in touch with my uncle through Harry Belafonte, who was a close friend of my of our you know, the Kennedys. Mm -hmm. But he was also funding the civil rights movement at that time, and he got in touch with my uncle Sergeant Shriver, mm -hmm. who then went to John Kennedy a senator and said um, and asked him to intervene. My uncle's staff did not want him to do it. My father had cut a deal with three southern governors to uh, to support my uncle, but they all said that if my uncle of John Kennedy supported Martin Luther King that, that they would switch their support to Nixon. Um, but in a private conversation without my father present, my other uncle, Sarge Shriver, persuaded uh, John Kennedy to call Coretta King. Mm -hmm. And he called her just a, a comfort call. And my father then immediately found out about it. And he told my uncle, Sarge Shriver, you just cost us the election. And now, Martin Luther King had gone to Nixon first. Mm -hmm. I mean, Coretta had gone to Nixon first. Because Nixon was very close with Martin Luther King at that point, mm -hmm. and Martin Luther King was supporting him at that point. And, um, you know, at that point, most blacks were voting Republican in the South because they were Lincoln Republicans. And, um, but, but Nixon would not return her phone calls, and that destroyed the relationship from, with King and Nixon from that on. My father was angry at Sarge Shriver for getting my uncle to do that. My father came back to our home, which was McLean, Virginia, and he was on his way to the airport, which was 15 minutes away. Mm -hmm. And he began thinking about it. And he hated bullies. And he began thinking about it in that framework. And by the time he got to the National Airport, he was steaming. And he personally, he, he called his staff. He said, I want, the name, I want the telephone number for that sheriff. He called the sheriff at night. Mm -hmm. And then he called the judge. And then he called the governor, Governor Van Dever, and he said, uh, is there something you can do to get Martin Luther King out of jail? 
Ben Deaver said, I don't think I can. And my father said, I want you to try, and then I want you to call me back and tell me what you did. And the next morning he was released. The judge released him. So from then on, my family had a very close relation with the Kings. And then, you know, the big, by, by 1962, civil rights was the, was the biggest issue for them, the presidency. Mm -hmm. Um, they helped him with the Freedom Riders, and you know, the Freedom Riders at that time, there had been a, federal, a, a Supreme Court case mm -hmm. that said you could not, that the bus companies, the Greyhound company that was putting blacks in the back of the bus, mm -hmm. could not do that on interstate commerce. And the Freedom Riders were a bunch of young kids, and they decided to test that out in the Deep South. Yeah. And one of their buses was burned in, in Anniston. They were severely, savagely beaten in Anniston and then in Montgomery. And my father then sent, at King's request, sent 400 U.S. Marshals to guard them. Yeah. And he helped King with the Selma March with Viola Lee Luzo. Uh, King at that point with it, had a boycott going in Montgomery, Alabama against the businesses. My father refereed the settlement of that. Mm -hmm. Um, and he helped them in with the housing discrimination in Chicago, and then he helped them organize the March on Washington in 1963. And uh, when my, my Martin Luther King came out against the Vietnam War in April of 1967, and a lot of the other civil rights leaders did not want him to do that. They wanted to stay in his lane. Right. But he said the war is, we can't separate the two issues, civil rights and the war. War is uh, impoverishing the poverty program, mm -hmm. and it also it's all black kids who are fighting that war, mm -hmm. and they're bringing home the violence. And so um, he came out against the war almost to the day that he gave that famous speech against the Vietnam War. He was murdered. Mm -hmm. My father was running at that time for president of the United States, and he was in Indianapolis when he found out. Uh, Martin, Martin was murdered, mm -hmm. and he. And by the way, after he got Martin Luther King out of prison, Daddy King, mm -hmm. was Martin's dad, gave a sermon at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, in which he endorsed my uncle. And and because of that, my uncle won the presidency. It was the narrowest margin in history. Mm -hmm. So it cemented the relationship between our families. My father learned that Martin Luther King, when he was about to speak in a, you know, in a, a black section of Indiana, Indianapolis, my father learned that Martin Luther King had been killed. He gave impromptu one of the best speeches of his career, yeah. and urging peace. He talked about his own brother had been killed by a white man, mm -hmm. and he said, "What we need is healing. Right. You know, we need to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of the world." And of 120 cities that rioted that night, including the city I was in, Washington, which was burned to the ground, mm -hmm. um, Indianapolis was the only city that didn't riot. And that is a tribute to my father's speech. And then when my dad was killed, when my dad died, I was with him in Los Angeles, and Greta Scott King was in the hospital with us. And then she flew back with us with my father's body on the plane. And she then uh, took that train ride to Washington, D.C., where there were two and a half million people on the train track, mm -hmm. and, and remained very, very close friends with my, with my mother, um, you know, uh, their whole lives. And, you know, I grew up very, very close to Marty King, to mm -hmm. Martin's son. Uh, so, you know, our families have been very close through all those years. Yeah, that's a beautiful story, especially, like I said, with this weekend. And I also think it kind of brings us full circle. Um, I couldn't help but thinking about the fact that you mentioned that there were students, young students that were part of the Freedom Riders that were you know, adamant about change. And interestingly enough, when I was talking about coming here and talking to you, a lot of the young people that are part of our staff are like, you know, we are, we are tired of what's going on in the world right now. We're not happy. And we're definitely open to hearing someone that can bring us a message that appeals to us. And so I'm wondering when you hear that type of feedback from young people, and we know that you are running as an independent candidate, and for so long, specifically the African American community feels like their vote has been kind of used. At one point, the majority of African Americans were Republican, and then for the, for the last uh, few decades, it's been 
democratic, and a lot of people don't even know that history. So with you coming and offering something very different, what do you think is the, is, could be the appeal, and why did you decide to, to run on the independent party? Uh, I, uh, you know, I ran because I had because the Democrats were fixing the rules to make sure that nobody could challenge President Biden. There's a lot of, as you know, there's a lot of African Americans who are um, who were uh, who were suspect of President Biden because of the, uh, his uh, sponsorship of the 1986 uh, drug laws and then the omnibus law in 1994. Uh, that created the the, uh, the prison industrial complex. Mm -hmm. the, the Ninety-four, you know, the eighty-six law made crack cocaine uh, punishable a hundred times the sentence that you would get for powder cocaine. Mm. And the uh, and the the only difference between those two is that powder cocaine was used by white kids mm -hmm. and crack cocaine was used by black kids. Mm -hmm. And it doubled that. Uh, that law, which President Biden sponsored, doubled the amount of, of blacks in prison mm -hmm. at that time. So between 1865 and 1994, mm -hmm. that it, there were a certain number of blacks in prison, and that number was doubled in eight years because of that law. And the law, you know, was bad, and, and President Biden has acknowledged that it was a bad law, but it's... Uh, it, hey, but he's done nothing to change it, and we need to end the, the, you know, there's people in jail from marijuana, one in every three blacks are not going to end up in prison, mm -hmm. black males, mm -hmm. and, um, and we need to change that, because once you go to prison, it's a lifetime sentence, you right. become a second class citizen in life. Let me talk about, you know, what I'm doing, I, what my program is to get economic vitality back in the young generation. Mm -hmm. My father, in 1966, walked through Bedford-Stuyvesant, which was one of the poorest um, minority communities in New York. Mm -hmm. And he, he saw something in that community that was unusual, which was there was a high degree of home ownership. Even though all the indicia of poverty were present, mm -hmm. people were taking care of their homes. Mm -hmm. People had flower pots on their homes. People were painting the stoops. They were sitting on them. There was a sense of community. And my father decided to devote his energies to bringing economic vitality to that community. Mm -hmm. And he, at that point, on Fulton Street in bed all the stores were boarded up. Mm -hmm. And he realized that the black community needed two things. It needed uh, access to capital, mm -hmm. which, you know, those communities are redlined. Uh, they, the, the banks, even when they don't officially redline them, are right. secretly redlining them. Mm -hmm. They're denying home improvement loans, home ownership loans, and that, when you do that, you're going to get crime. Mm -hmm. And my father um, began, you know, basically started an empowerment zone there, an opportunity zone, and he brought in, he also knew that there was no, there wasn't a lot of accrued business knowledge. Mm -hmm. There was a huge entrepreneurial spirit. But people did not know how to do accounting. They didn't know how to do inventory. All the things that you need to know, it's which you know, as a graduate of Harvard, he, if he wanted to start a business, he could call somebody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you lived in those communities, you didn't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. And so he began, began bringing business people from the top corporations in America, give one day a week mm -hmm. to spend in bed time. When he died, I took over his place in the board. And I've served there for 30 years, and I've watched that community become rejuvenated and taken part in it. Mm -hmm. And you know, we did it by um, through tax credits, through creating opportunity zones, through through teaching accrued business knowledge, mm -hmm. um, through micro loan programs, and uh, and through providing daycare so that people can have jobs, mm -hmm. and all of the things that you need to do. Today, Fulton Street and Atlantic Avenue, every store in them, uh, on those streets is open. There's mm -hmm. a vibrant uh, entrepreneurship in that community, and it's become a model uh, for community development yeah. all around the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I want to do that uh, for this country. Well, that is, that is what our readers want to know about. Like I said, we have a large population of our readers who are interested in entrepreneurship. And I love everything that you just said. That's a wonderful example 
I guess I would want to ask you, you know, for our last question here, I know we, your, your time is limited, but for the, for the homeowner, for the African-American business owner that has not gone to Harvard, but still has pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, so to speak, and has started their business, but is, is steadily fighting against, you know, issues because they didn't have those loans, they didn't have that capital, what would your message be and what, what, why should we put you in office? I mean, quite, quite honestly, what can you tell our community about what you want to do when it comes to um, empowering our communities, empowering those entrepreneurs that have been out there working, struggling, even with, you know, knowing that they are, they're starting out 10 steps behind, you know, their, 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 their white counterparts? Uh, in, in terms of why should people believe me, well, I would say this, I, I'm not a politician. I never intended to run for president of the United States. But I, if you look at what I've been doing for the past 40 years, it is a commitment to those issues. It's a commitment to environmental justice, commitment to business development in the black community. I have a long track record of doing that. And, you know, I believe that I'm in a better position to do that because of what I've done with my life than anybody else who's running for president. The commitment I have, the, the, there's a lot of things that need to be done in the black community. The first is fix the education system. We need education choice. We need the capacity to expand the charter schools in New York. There's 20,000 kids who are going to one charter school, and there and it's on, and there there's a long list of 100,000 kids who want to get into it, mm -hmm. and um, and they're being stifled. And those charter schools do miracles. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what we're finding is that the, uh, the ability to get into college is not cultural, it's not environmental, it's not economic, it's bad schools. Mm -hmm. That's what's blocking people. Mm -hmm. And when you give people good schools with discipline and a good education, the, you know, the success school in New York, which is a charter school almost all black, is now outperforming the best high schools in terms of college placement and graduation in New York, uh, better than, than uh, Scarsdale High, which is one of the highest in, in New York. But we can do that, but we need to make that available. And we need school choice. We need to say to black parents, um, you don't need to keep your kids in a school that's not working for them. You can have a choice to move someplace else. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is we need access to capital. There's a, and the, the problem is that there's only 20 black-owned banks in our country. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and they're, they're all underfunded and funded by the Fed. And when you fund those black-owned banks, they spend money in those communities. Mm -hmm. we, um, and, you know, we need to, and that's what I'll do. Mm -hmm. I'll make sure that those black-owned banks are getting adequate cash. Mm -hmm. That, that cash is being directed to those communities for home improvement loans, for business loans, and uh, you know, one of the things, one part of liberal ideology is that we have to end racism. Right. You're never going to end racism. Right. It's part of who we are. Right. It's the 20,000 generations that we spend wandering the African savanna and little tribal groups fighting each other. And tribalism is hardwired into our system. Mm -hmm. But what you need to do is equip kids so that racism doesn't affect them. And you know, when I was a kid, they, they, my uncle was the first Catholic president. There was tremendous bigotry against Catholics. I was called when I was a kid all kinds of names, a mick, a mackerel snatcher, all these names that were derogatory for my religion. Mm -hmm. It never affected me because I had confidence in myself. I knew I was getting a good education. I had a family that loved me. I knew my life was going to be. So when somebody would say that stuff to me, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't be thinking, what's wrong with me? I'd be thinking, what's wrong with that person? <laughs> right? Yeah. And that's where we want black kids to be able to, to be resilient right. so that when they do encounter those kind of challenges, mm -hmm. they're able to cope with them because they have an education. Right. Because they have a future, because they're proud of their family, because right. their dad is working and running the economic support. support system. Right, and if you've got economic opportunity, you don't need anything. You can have everybody in the world hate you, and it's not going to matter. I love it. that. And on that note, <laughs> it's definitely what our viewers are wanting to hear. It's not about necessarily ending racism. It really is yep. about allowing us to have access 
to things that should have been that we should have had access the entire time. And I appreciate a candidate actually speaking to the truth and letting us know that I'm not going to be able to fix racism, but what I can do is stop uh, the gatekeepers that are keeping your community from being able to be economically empowered. Exactly. Okay. Thank you so much. What an amazing honor to be able to sit with you on Martin Luther King. Uh, holiday weekend. I'm looking forward to this conversation. But again, from the family here at Rolling Out, we want to thank you and look forward to hearing more from you over 2024. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you.